that was the fastest 10 seconds of my life. Oh, there goes the other one. Doing both. Good thing I'm on free report. <laughs> All right, this is Bull Run Steam Plant. It's part of the Tennessee Valley Authority power generation. And this is the aftermath of the demolition. Now, as you just saw behind me, they didn't demolish the actual big building of the steam plant. What they did, they demolished the two towers and they um, did something to the side. There's a silo or something. I think they took the silo out. Um, this steam plant has a lot of history in this valley, in this area. And I'm going to take this camera and this history lesson to my house because it is kind of noisy out here and it's starting to get really hot. But I figured, you know, I'd start out the video showing the towers going down, then show you just in general, you know, what it looks like now and then talk more about it at home. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the fishing around Bull Run Steam Plant, what it was before this demolition. Now, when they ran the steam plant in the wintertime, it was one of the few steam plants that was allowed to bring the water up to about 80 degrees. So the water coming in was around, you know, 40 or 50 degrees, and they would raise it all the way up to about 80 degrees. And if they ran it for one week, in that first week, skipjacks would come in to, you know, the exit, you know, the water exit area of the steam plant. And it made for a great place to catch skipjacks. And then after that first week, the striped bass would come in and shoo off all of the skipjacks. They'd scare them all off. Now, man, I, I tell you what, this waterway is not stalked by striped bass. However, years and years ago, a state record striped bass was caught just out in the river, right in front of Bull Run Steam Plant. And the story goes, from what I'm told, they were in a little John boat. It's two guys in a little John boat. They hooked a massive, like, 50, 60-pound striped bass, and it towed them upriver and then downriver and then upriver until they finally landed it, and then they registered it as a state record here in Tennessee. Now, a fun thing to know, the Tennessee Wildlife Agency, they do not stalk striped bass into this lake. They don't. So how did, you know, a state record end up in a lake where they don't stalk striped bass and striped bass, they're not native at all to our entire area. There has never been a striped bass in our area until they started stalking them. Striped bass basically have three ways to get into this waterway. And the first way is the hatchery upstream. Escapees coming out of the hatchery, getting into the lake. That is one way that they can get in there. That hatchery is where they produce all of the striped bass for most of the, you know, rivers and lakes that the wildlife agency stalks striped bass in. The second way is the hatchery as well. They go out to other lakes and shock up the biggest striped bass they can find to spawn at the hatchery. And when they're done with them, they take these large fish and they just put them in the river. And that creates like monster fish in that specific, you know, lake and river system. Obviously, like I said, they can't spawn there, but you get, you know, the escapees and then you get the breeders. They drop them into the water. Now, there is another way that they can get into this waterway as well, and it is the lock downstream. They don't operate that lock all the time. 
And that is, to my knowledge, the only lock that um, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that's the only one that they actually run. All the other locks are controlled by the, the Corps of Engineers or whatever. Uh, but this lock is run by TVA. And it's not run that often, so there's not much traffic via boats or fish that go through it. But they can make it into the lake through the lock. This basically made this fishery a really, really unique striper fishery. Now, after two weeks, on about week three or even week four, you had muskies coming into the area chewing off all of the stripers. They'd scare them out of the area and it would be a whole bunch of muskies. The state record muskie was caught down river from the steam plant. And because of that warm water flow that hits that bank just right, you can literally turn the fish of 10,000 casts into the fish of three or four and end up with a 40 to 50 inch muskie. Now, there are a couple of other fish that the steam plant attracts. One of them is the quillback. That's basically like a carp-like fish, but it has like a quill on its back. And they are incredibly hard to catch. They do congregate there when the water's warm, but I have yet to catch one. But I have seen them caught in many different ways. You also get carp and every other fish that's, you know, in the waterway that, you know, comes to the steam plant when it's running. But in general, you know, that's usually what happens with at least the bigger fish. Now, if you fast forward to today, that pattern is not going to happen anymore. Basically, the muskies are going to spread out throughout the entire lake. The stripers are going to do the same thing. And the skipjacks are going to do the same thing. This may impact the amount of bait in the lake as well, which could impact the fishing. Now, on a positive note, I was told this fossil plant was one of the worst in the TVA system. They had trouble getting it fired up, and it cost TVA a ton, a ton of money. They had problems from the get-go. If you check out this iCard above, that is of a video where I did an interview of one of my buddies mothers, grandmothers, that lived in that valley. The original stack, it destroyed everything. It hurt car paint. It hurt the siding on the homes. It hurt the, hurt the roofs of the homes. It, you know, took out plants. It did a lot of damage to that valley. It did so much damage that if I, if I remember right, the amount of money that TVA gave each individual homeowner in that valley, they could have bought a second home back then. This was like the 60s and the 70s. They spent or put out a ton of money just to, you know, just because of the damage this coal plant did to the valley. And then they had to pay millions of dollars to build the scrubber on the plant. And it's basically you're building a scrubber on a plant that is problematic. So here they are, this brand new beautiful scrubber, and they can barely get the thing to fire up when needed. This plant, it needed to be demolished, period. I do know some of you are fans of coal, and, you know, if, if you think that a steam plant or a fossil plant needs to be at this place... It would be cheaper in the long run to do what they're doing to the steam plant right now by leveling it and just starting out new because this plant was a major problem. And I'm kind of glad that they got rid of it. I remember when I was younger, I would put out tape for like science experiments for my science class and the tape would have like little bitty bits of coal all over it. That plant, even with the scrubber, still put out, you know, stuff into the air that we all breathed in, if they could even get it to run. Now, going forward, there is a debate on what they want to do to replace that steam plant, if they're going to replace it. And one of the rumors is nuclear, which I think 
you know, is a good idea. Nuclear isn't as bad as some people think. You know, everybody's wor worried about, like, another Chernobyl or uh, Fukasami or whatever. I can't even say that one or whatever. Uh, but the newer reactors, we, you know, they're built from what we've learned in the past. And even the nuclear fuel, that the spent fuel is minimal nowadays. In fact, I thought I read somewhere that you could put in one football stadium all the used nuclear food, blah, 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 fuel we've had over the past forever, since the beginning of time, pretty much, into like an end zone or something of a football field. It's not that much right now, but it, it, it is a storage issue. And sometimes you can actually reuse that for other things like, you know, in medical. That being said, personally, I actually like solar. And that's because we have a fusion reactor that we orbit, or orbits us, depending on what you think. That fusion reactor puts enough energy, or at least sends enough energy to our planet, Earth, <laughs> to power everything, and then some. I mean, it is an incredible amount of energy. And all we need to do is have better solar panels. We need to work on making better solar panels and be smart with where we put them. You know, I, I agree with some of you that, you know, Vacant land or what could be farmland shouldn't be turned into giant solar panel fields. We should be putting solar on our rooftops. We should be putting solar in places where it makes sense, like agrivoltics. Agrivoltics is where you take solar panels and you put them with crops that can benefit from the shade. So you have solar panels, and then food. And that food will grow better because of the shade from the solar panels. It's called agrivoltics. There are a lot of crops that wouldn't benefit, so, you know, it's not going to be every single possible crop, just the ones that would benefit. Mostly, it needs to be on, you know, a roof. We've gotten to a point with solar now that, you know, a small system on a roof can almost replace the energy used by that home. And it's only going to get better. And there are two things that hold back solar. One is politics, and two is misinformation. And I'm not going to address either one of those in this video because this is a video about the demolition of Bull Run Steam Plant. A steam plant that's been, that I've lived near for my entire life. Or at least a majority of my life. I did try some time trying to leave the area, but I decided to come back because I like it here more than elsewhere. But yeah, I will definitely miss the fishing around Bull Run Steam Plant, and I hope that they put something in there in the future that can at least create current that might attract some of the fish back. Now, as always, I want to thank you for taking your time out of your day to actually watch my video. I really, really appreciate it. And just as a quick update to my channel, I am going to take another try at making one video a day. I don't know if I'm going to make it this time because I have a bunch of booked fishing trips that are in the way right now. But I'm going to give it a try and see if I can do it for the month of July. So make sure you're subscribed to my channel if you're not share my videos, and uh, just just bear with me for this fun video adventure. I may end up doing the AI video that I've been thinking about doing for a long time just so I can have another video for you guys to watch. Like this video, that video will be hard to not go political with. I could have went into a political direction with this. I tried my best not to. Thanks again for watching, and I do hope to see you next time.